Let's go over to page 220. Page 220, you had questions 1 through 3 and 6 through 10. It is uh, a variety day here during Spirit Week. It is team day if you want it to be, which looks like Michael, Audrey, and I all went teams. And then um, it's decade day if you want decade day. And it's tacky day if you want tacky day. Kind of went tacky day, so. All right. Um, go Colts, I figure. If you can't support your team when they stink like a, bat of old, like a can of old tuna fish, when, you know, what good are you as a fan? So yes, the Colts stink on ice, but I'm still a Colts fan. And hope we figure something out. Anyway, we need a quarterback, we need wide receivers, we need a coach, a defensive end. We pretty much need a whole new team. That's pretty much what we need, a whole new team. Anyway, and more money. More money to pay these people because we're paying the wrong people too much money. Anyway, um, back to physics, page 220. Uh, questions 1 through 3 and 6 through 10. Question 1. When you jump into a cold, spring-fed lake, is thermal equilibrium ever attained? And explain why or why not. Kendall? Um, when you jump into a cold, spring-fed lake, thermal equilibrium will not be attained Well, let's suppose it wasn't a spring-fed lake. Suppose it was just a cold lake and you jumped in. Would you attain thermal equilibrium? Still you would. If it wasn't spring-fed, eventually your body would, you would die, right, of hypothermia. Your body would shut down, you'd die, and your body would become the same temperature as the lake. But if it's spring-fed, and technically the water around you would slightly warm, um, <laughs> not enough. But if it's spring-fed, it's just going to continue being fed by fresh, more cold water. So, no, you're not going to reach thermal equilibrium. That was the key part of the question was the spring-fed lake. Um, don't, don't jump into cold lake and stay there for too long, people. All right, if you're turning blue or purple, come out. Anyway, we discovered uh, growing up in Pensacola that if you go to, like, Pensacola, it's Florida, it's hot, it's warm. Well, the water's not, right? The water gets nice and cold in the, in the uh, wintertime, and water takes a while. We're going to get to this later in the chapter to warm back up. So... School's out in May, yay, let's go to the beach. Mm. Didn't work so well. You get in that water, and on the Gulf side particularly, there's the sound side of the Gulf side in Pensacola, there's a Pensacola Sound, and that water warms up okay because the water doesn't flow as, as much that, in that area, and it's a little shallower, so it warms up a little more. But in, in June even, that water is still cold. So we've discovered July. July is when you go to the beach in Florida because by then, the Gulf waters are actually warm enough that you don't turn purple in about three minutes. <laughs> You're purple, get out of there. And, um, and uh, August is great too, it's even warmer, but in August there's jellyfish fragments from the storms that have come through already and broken them up into pieces. So you get stung, you know, little minor stings, but they're still stings. And then it's even warmer in September, even warmer in October. And that's when all the hurricanes blast everything because the water's so warm. And we talked about it in Earth and Space Science back in junior high. Anyway. Number two, what is the basic reference point for the Kelvin scale of temperature, and what is the temperature of this reference point? Audrey? Uh, the ba basic reference point for the Kelvin scale of temperature is absolute zero, um, measured at minimum 273.13 degrees Celsius. That's not the reference point. That's the lowest point. That's the easy point to remember on Kelvin. It's not the reference point. Michael? Um, I have 273.15 Kelvin as the reference point. Your a hundredth of a degree off. Um, Kendall? Uh, 273.16. Good, 0.16 Kelvin. It's called the triple point of water, and uh, that's the basic reference point. Number three, let's go back to Audrey. Why is the Kelvin scale called an absolute scale, and why is it an equal interval scale? Uh, Kelvin is an absolute scale because it is the lowest possible temperature valued at zero Kelvin. It is also an equal inter interval scale because it cannot be measured directly. Right, you'd measure it in Celsius, and Celsius and Kelvin measure along with each other. They're in equal intervals with each other. A degree Celsius and a Kelvin are the same. Uh, let's skip down to number six. How do the freezing point and boiling point of water register on the Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit scales? Let's start with the freezing point. What are the three freezing points of water? Michael? The freezing point of water is 273.15 Kelvin, uh, 0 degrees Celsius, and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Good. What about the boiling point of water on the Kelvin, Celsius, and Fahrenheit scales? Kendall? 
Good. Number seven, state the formulas for converting kelvins to degrees Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. Audrey? Um, the formulas for converting kelvins to Celsius is uh, Pc equals 3k minus 273.15, and then in Celsius, the Fahrenheit is Tf equals 95 Tc plus 32. Excellent. Number eight, how would you convert kelvins to degrees Fahrenheit, Michael? Um, kelvin to degrees Fahrenheit, you first have to convert to Celsius and then convert to Fahrenheit. Perfect. Convert to Celsius first, then convert to Fahrenheit. Number nine, how much does a gas change its volume when its temperature increases or decreases by a degree Celsius? Kel uh, Kelvin. Kendall? <laughs> <laughs> um, a gas can expand or contract its volume when its temperature can increase or decrease by one degree Celsius. Well, right, that's true, right? We talked about that back in, uh, I think that was uh, Charles's law. Volume and temperature directly related. So if you increase the temperature, it'll expand. If you decrease the temperature, it will contract, but how much of its volume will it increase or decrease? Audrey? Um, basically put something to the third One two hundred seventy third, approximately, of its volume will increase or decrease with an increase or decrease in degrees Celsius, and that's significant. Number 10, how is absolute zero defined, and what are its values on the Kelvin and Celsius scales? Let's go back to Kendall. Um, absolute zero is defined as the temperature at which all gases should Good. Now, technically, just a formality, it's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. There's no unit on it there, no degrees, but uh, yes, good. Zero Kelvin and negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. Um, all right, flip back if you would to the beginning of the chapter, page 206. And uh, go and take out your notes. Beginning a new section on thermodynamics. Now, the test you just took over chapter 13, historically, one of the hardest tests that you'll take all year. The upcoming test over chapter 14, and it's kind of a standalone chapter, and kind of in the middle of everything, just thermodynamics gets its own little, its own little chapter, and um, so it gets its own test. It tends to be one of the easier tests, so rebound from a hard test with an easier test, as long as you know your stuff, of course, right? So don't be like, oh, I don't have to pay attention. Just this should be easier to wrap your mind around. Um, first thing for me to write down is this topic of thermal energy. Thermal energy. We say that an object can be studied, its properties can be measured as long as it has energy, as long as it trans transmits energy. And you have internally energy. Um, we remember from chemistry class, we said, and even earlier this year we mentioned, that the atoms uh, within a solid, the molecules within a solid, are moving. Not very much, it's, it's just slight vibration. But there's just a tiny bit of vibration to the molecules of a solid. In a liquid, of course, they're free-flowing, and in a gas, they're really freely moving. There's no constraint on them in a gas. Um, but the atoms and molecules do move. And uh, if they move faster, things begin to feel to us to be warmer. Thermal energy is defined as the internal kinetic energy of an object's atoms or molecules. The internal kinetic energy of an object's atoms and molecules. When you heat a pot of water, you're literally making the atoms and molecules inside the water begin to move faster and faster and faster as you're heating it. If you throw something in the refrigerator, you're causing the atoms and molecules of the substance to move slower and slower and slower as it cools down. Uh, if you freeze something, you're causing, and we're going to get into the math behind this a little bit later, but you're causing the atoms and molecules to go from freely flowing to now simply vibrating in place. You're decreasing the amount of energy in that object. So I remember this from chemistry because I look at the chemistry test that Ms. Morse writes. Um, the energy, the ener state of matter that has the highest energy then must be a, well, okay. <laughs> I was thinking of the main three that we win again on a regular basis. Yeah. Gas, right? Gas is going to have the highest energy state because they're, they're able to move the fastest, move the most. If the molecule, remember we talked about about a thousand miles an hour, these atoms and molecules of a gas are, are bombarding us right now, the air pressure. And so I mean, that's, that's a lot of movement, that's a lot of kinetic energy. 
In a liquid, they don't move nearly as quickly. But you remember Brownian motion, right? You drop a little food coloring in there and it begins to spread itself out because the atoms and molecules are moving. There's more energy. And of course, you take, for instance, ice cube. They're not moving. They're, well, moving. They're vibrating. Very little motion, right? So thermal energy is simply the internal kinetic energy of an object's atoms or molecules. Temperature, then, is the measure of an object's thermal energy. Temperature is the measure of an object's thermal energy. When you take your temperature, you're feeling sick. Mom feels your forehead. She says, oh, that feels warm. And she puts a thermometer under your tongue, or she scans your forehead now because we're high tech these days, or uh, whatever. Um, she's measuring how much thermal energy your body has at the moment. Why in a fever, by the way, does your temperature go up? Why do you have more thermal energy in a fever? Your body's moving, causing blood to flow more rapidly through the body. Heart rate increases, blood flow increases. That's why the temperature seems to go up because the body's moving faster because it's, it's in a higher state of energy. It's fighting off some kind of infection. Uh, in that sense, you would say a fever is a good thing unless it starts causing seizures, then it's a bad thing. But a fever is a good thing in that that's how your body fights things off. Also, heat is a catalyst and accelerate. Anyway, um, a thermometer <laughs> is the instrument used to measure temperature. A thermometer is the instrument used to measure temperature. That's not a hard one to remember, I hope. Now, a term we will often get confused with thermal energy, and we have to keep the two separate, is the term heat. Thermal energy is how much kinetic energy an object's atoms and molecules have. Heat is the measure, is the transfer of thermal energy from one body to another. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy from one body to another. So if the energy isn't transferring anywhere or isn't moving anywhere, then technically there is no heat. However, have you ever shook somebody's hand at church and you're like an older person, you're like, ooh, that hand's cold, right? Or uh, you sit down in a seat in class after someone else was just sitting, like, ooh, this seat is warm. Okay, we tend to, we would call, call that heat. Well, technically you're right, it is heat because thermal energy is flowing. Right? As you shake the elderly lady's hand, you're like, ooh, she's got cold hands. Energy is flowing from your hand into hers. That's heat. The movement of the thermal energy from you, who have nice warm hands, to elderly lady who does not have warm hands. Or you sit down in a seat, and the seat has more thermal energy than you, which is a weird thought, right? And you sit down, and thermal energy begins flowing into you from the seat. I'm like, oh, there's heat there. Well, technically, yes, because the thermal energy is flowing. So heat is simply the transfer of thermal energy from one body to another. You do need to note this, and this, this makes sense as we think about it, but heat always flows from high thermal energy to low thermal energy. Whichever object has the higher thermal energy is the direction in which the heat will flow. So we tend to maybe go outside on a cold day here and uh, think, ooh, man, it's cold. Or you open a window you're like, ooh, we're letting the cold in. Technically, unless there's wind blowing the cold air in, if it's a still day, cold does not come in. Heat goes out. Thermal energy flows outward. So if you step outside on a cold day without a coat, why do you feel cold? Because thermal energy is escaping from your body as it tries to warm the air around you. Problem is it's not going to warm the air around you, so you just continue to feel colder and colder. That's why you put on a coat. It keeps the thermal energy from getting away. That makes sense? Um, so heat always flows from high thermal energy to low thermal energy. At some point, if you were to shake old lady's hand long enough, her hand would no longer feel cold. The reason it no longer feels cold is because thermal energy has flowed from your hand into her hand until eventually they are the same thermal energy. Once they have the same level of thermal energy, heat is no longer going to flow back and forth between. So your hand will no longer feel warm to her and hers will no longer feel cold to you. Theoretically, again, technically, I know the body is continuing to heat itself as the heart pumps blood, whatever. Um, but theoretically, okay, all things being equal, we would attain something called thermal equilibrium. And once again, I can't make a cursive R after a B. All right, thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium is the point at which two objects have the same thermal energy the point at which two objects have the same thermal energy and heat flow stops. The point at which two objects have the same thermal energy and heat flow stops. 
Now again, technically, the way your God designs your body, your heart will pump blood to warm things. So if you put your hand on, you hold something cold, obviously your hand will warm the object and your body will continue to pump more blood a little bit faster, a little more accelerated rate so that you'll have more thermal energy to share until it reaches that same thermal energy point. Um, but for instance, if I had an object that was cold and I dropped it into a pot of water that wasn't able to continue heating itself, maybe somehow contained in such a way that heat thermal energy wouldn't flow to the environment around it, well, that cold object would warm up. It would absorb thermal energy from the water around it until it reached the same level. So the energy of the water is going down, the energy of the object is going up until at some point they reach the same. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be halfway between, though. Right? We'll get into the math of this later on in the chapter. The, uh, the object's thermal energy probably will rise faster than the temperature energy of the water will drop. But at some point, they will reach that same thermal energy if left long enough. That's thermal equilibrium. Questions on these terms. By the way, that's the principle of a thermometer, right? That you stick the therm How many of you had to stick the thermometer in your tongue, maybe when you were little? How many still, that, that's what parents are like, I ain't buying one of those scanner thermometers. Just keep sticking it under your tongue. Okay, we had a scanner thermometer, and I could not trust that thing. Like, it... I was like, forget this thing. We have the one that goes under the tongue. We'll just sanitize it and stick it under the tongue. I had to suffer. The, at, least, at least the one that we use with our kids has little numbers that change, and it goes beep when it's done, and it takes like 15 to 20 seconds. I grew up in the era where you had a glass one with mercury inside that mom would shake. She put it under your tongue, and uh, you'd be there like two or three minutes until eventually... The glass and the, uh, the mercury reached the same thermal energy as my, as my mouth. Once it reached the same thermal energy, the mercury was no longer rising. She'd look at it, she'd tell me what my temperature was, and I'd be stuck in bed the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> miserable life, right? <laughs> um, but that's, that's the principle of a thermometer, even an outdoor thermometer, right? The air has one temperature. If it were warmer when you first stick it out there, its temperature will drop as thermal energy leaves that thermometer sensor to the outside air, and then all attains thermal equilibrium. Now, how do we measure temperature? We'll talk about heat more later. Let's lock in on temperature and actually measuring thermal energy. There are three different temperature scales you read about in your homework, and let's talk about them a little bit. First temperature scale, first way in which we'll measure thermal energy, is on what's called the Fahrenheit scale. The Fahrenheit scale. F-A-H-R-E-N-H-E-I-T. He's not an American. Okay. Gabriel Fahrenheit, I believe, was he Danish? He was German. Gabriel Fahrenheit, a German physicist. He came up with his own temperature scale. And um, he said this. I'm going to take this saline solution, a saltwater solution, so to speak, and I'm going to see at what point it freezes. The point at which it will freeze is what I'm going to call zero. And from there, he just kind of calibrated temperatures as he felt was nice and easy for him. And uh, the problem was you had to concentrate the saline solution just right because, as you'll remember from chemistry, salt causes things to melt. It raises the uh, boiling point. It lowers the freezing point. And so if you didn't get it just right, it was really hard to calibrate. And then, you know, we like to do things with pure water because it's easier to purify water than concentrate it to just a perfect salinity. And so there's a bunch of processes to purify water. And so we found that water, now pure water, freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's kind of an annoying random number. Now, we here in the U.S. like it because we know it. It's what we do. And uh, found that water boiled the way he calibrated his degrees and stuff. And I believe it was so that a degree Fahrenheit would be the smallest perceptible difference. You can tell a difference between 67 degrees in the house and 68. Have you ever noticed, like, if you're used to one temperature and it's just one degree lower, you're like, it feels cold. And you raise the temperature just one degree and you can feel a difference, right? So a degree Fahrenheit is supposed to be that just noticeable difference, if you will, in temperature. And based on that, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, it's kind of a random number. 212, like, where does that come from? I don't know, that's how we figured it out. And all because he started basing it on a, a saline solution. And then he found, and this was accepted for years, that body temperature of a normal, healthy person was 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But lately, they've conducted a number of studies, and they found 98.6 isn't normal body temperature anymore. Why isn't it? I don't know. Maybe it's our sedentary lifestyle. 
right? Again, as you move more, have you ever noticed you exercise, you get warmer? Why? Because as you move more, you're causing blood to circulate more. You're moving the muscles. You're causing your, an increase in the kinetic energy of your bodies, atoms and molecules. Your body temperature goes up. Well, if we lead a more sedentary life on average now, well, they found the average body temperature now for a normal healthy human is 97.5 degrees Fahrenheit. It's changed over time. I believe this was a Stanford University study uh, done recently. So if your body temperature comes out to the mid-97s, that's normal. You don't have a low body temperature. I always wondered about that because my body temperature tends to be the mid-97s. And so when I saw that study, I'm like, okay, that makes, that makes me feel better about myself. I'm normal, <laughs> sort of. All right. Because of the randomness of these numbers, Fahrenheit is no longer used in science. Fahrenheit's no longer used in science. It's used for quite a while, but people got tired of the weird numbers. Really, the only places that use it would be the United States of America because we're stubborn. We've been using it all these years. We are not changing. I am not learning how to read a new thermometer thingy. Okay, I like my Fahrenheit degrees. I like feeling like if it's 60, it's beautiful. If it's 70, that's okay for inside. If it's 30, that's cold. Plus, it doesn't go negatives very easily, especially around here. I like my Fahrenheit. So it's used in the US, but it's not used in science. Instead, scientists came up with a better way. And they said, we're going to devise a scale in which pure water, that's easier to work with anyway, freezes at zero. It will boil at 100 and will break down everything in between into equal increments called degrees. And so the Celsius scale is just a nice scale. And sometimes you'll hear it uh, used the term centigrade. Centi, of course, meaning 100 because it's based on 100 degrees. But if you hear, you know, maybe a, a foreign broadcast or something, temperatures have plunged to negative 27 degrees centigrade. Okay, that's Celsius, same thing. Okay, uh, but Celsius, zero degree, water freezes. 100 degrees Celsius, water boils. Normal body temperature used to be 37 degrees Celsius. I believe that's what you learned when you were in uh, junior high and elementary. It is now 36 degrees Celsius. It's the accepted normal body temperature of a healthy human being. So the Celsius scale. This is the main one we will use in this class. This is the main one used in science. This is the one that's used everywhere else in the world, but us and I think Liberia might still use Fahrenheit because they were founded by Americans and freed men who went over back to uh, Africa. So I believe in Liberia may also use Fahrenheit, but everybody else besides us uses Celsius, and we stubbornly cling to what we know and love so dearly. Well, somebody, Lord Kelvin, got the idea of, hmm, well, what if I could come up with a way of measuring that doesn't have to mess with negatives, though? Because negatives can be annoying, right? I teach that in my math. I don't like negatives. So I don't like negatives either. What if I said that the absolute lowest temperature imaginable is zero? And we just work our way up from there. Well, for one thing, you're going to get some pretty high temperatures, right? And Kelvin will always have the highest temperatures of all. But how do they come up with it? Something that was asked in the homework was what happens as a gas temperature, as a gas's temperature is increased or decreased a degree Celsius? It decreases or increases about a 273rd of its volume. So imagine. You drop the temperature a degree Celsius. One 273rd of that, starting at zero degrees, one 273rd of that volume disappears. It contracts, right? Another 273rd for every degree. Well, how many degrees are you going to have to go down before that gas is gone? Now, some gases, most, in fact, all gases so far they've discovered, will decrease faster than that, will decrease more than that. They will liquefy long before you get to absolute zero. But based on the... So they're not gases anymore. They're suddenly now super cool liquids, if you will. But um, all gases would have to vanish as, in, as existing gases if you went down 273 degrees below zero Celsius. They tweaked the number a little bit. But that's how we come up with the idea of the Kelvin scale, named in his honor. Interesting, I mentioned in the homework, Kelvin doesn't have degrees. It's just Kelvin's. Yes, when you discover something, you can name it after yourself and whatever, Kelvin's. But um, zero Kelvin, now it's never actually been reached. They've gotten close. I believe they've gotten down to around four Kelvin uh, because, again, you have to remove 
heat. You have to remove thermal energy from a setting to get the temperature to go lower and lower and lower, trying for literally zero thermal energy is what zero Kelvin would be. But zero Kelvin would be the lowest theoretical possible temperature. And it's negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. So almost exactly negative 273. Negative 273.15 degrees Celsius is that low point. And again, just know that at zero degrees Celsius, a decrease of one degree Celsius results in a decrease of one 273rd of the volume of any gas. That's why and how the Kelvin scale was devised, noting the shrinking that happens or the contracting of the gas that occurs as the temperature drops, again, based on Charles's law. Volume and temperature directly related, and that's the ratio, 273rd. This is the point at which, therefore, no gas could exist. I think I said it, I don't know that I wrote it or had you write it. So no gas can exist at that low temperature, zero Kelvin. And again, so far by all experiments, they haven't gotten that far down, but they've been close. Now what's interesting is that Celsius and Kelvin are equal interval with each other. Celsius and Kelvin are equal interval scales. Together, they rise and fall equally. So as Celsius goes up a degree, Kelvin goes up a Kelvin. Celsius goes down five degrees. Kelvin goes down five Kelvins. They go together. You know this from your junior high and elementary days. Celsius and Fahrenheit, not together, are they? No. Uh, actually, for every, nine, for every five degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit will rise or fall five, 9 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a 9 fifths relationship uh, that you're used to with that equaling point being 0 and 32. And so that's how we, of course, would convert between the two of those. When they calibrate uh, the really high-end Celsius Kelvin thermometers, they base the reference point off of a very unique temperature, a very unique situation. These are both based on something called the triple point of water. These are both, both based on the triple point of water. Triple point, basically triple, of course, meaning three. The triple point of water is a unique point at which water can exist in all three phases at once. Solid, liquid, and gas. They can literally make steam ice and water coexist at the same time. The only way this is possible is at extremely low pressures. You remember what standard atmospheric pressure is? One atmosphere or 760 torr or 1.0135 pascals. Locking on the 760 torr, that's normal atmospheric pressure, right? What would a vacuum's pressure be? Zero, right? Zero torr. Well, if they could lower the pressure to about 4.5, what is 4.58 torr? So right around 4.5 torr, extremely low pressure, almost a vacuum, but not quite. And they have the temperature at approximately uh, 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, so just, just above the freezing point. At this low pressure, and remember, pressure and temperature are directly related as well, at this low pressure and this low temperature right above the freezing point, Water can exist in all three phases. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a video that uh, University of California in Santa Cruz did this in their laboratory. So um, we'll show the video here at the end. If you're watching on YouTube, you can pause this video and bring that one up. But uh, really interesting. So the triple point of water then is uh, 273.16 uh, Kelvin or 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. And again, it's such a unique temperature that it makes for very good calibration. Right, so that's how those are set. But you need to know that that's the reference point. The triple point of water is the reference point for both Celsius and Kelvin. Technically, Fahrenheit's reference point is a saline solution freezing, but we don't really need to worry about that because we're going to use it in science anyway. Now, we do use it here in the U.S., though, so it bears knowing for our own purposes, but we're really not going to do uh, much of anything with Fahrenheit, other than get rid of it if we come across it. Okay, so that'll be that. Questions on these temperature scales?
how we measure temperature, how we measure the thermal energy that an object has. All right, so let's talk then about how to convert back and forth between these temperature scales, because we'll have to be able to make those conversions. First of all, if you wanted to go from Celsius to Kelvin, it's pretty easy. Remember, Celsius drops all the way down to negative 273.15, where Kelvin hits zero. So if you can remember the absolute zero, by the way, I, I failed to mention this, add this in your notes. Kelvin's called an absolute scale. Kelvin's called an absolute scale, hence absolute zero, but it's an absolute scale. Think back to your algebra days. What does absolute value mean? No negatives, practically speaking, technically distance from zero on the number line, but no negatives, right? As soon as you put those absolute value bars, negatives disappear. Well, guess what Kelvin has done? It's gotten rid of negatives. So we call it an absolute scale because there are no negative temperatures. Realize the other two do have negative temperatures, right? Which means Kelvin's always the biggest. You might want to jot that in your notes. Kelvin, always biggest. Has to be. Well, mm, Fahrenheit accelerate in extremely high temperatures, I take that back, because of the rate at which Fahrenheit increases over Celsius, at extremely high temperatures, Fahrenheit may overtake it, actually, when you get up to the thousands of degrees. With what we're working with, Kelvin will be the biggest. And the reason I say that is because if you need Kelvin, you're going to make it bigger. So the Kelvin is equal to the Celsius plus 273.15. If you wanted to go the other direction, you wanted Celsius, you take the Kelvin and subtract 273.15. It's a stupid, easy formula. The problem is students get confused. Wait, do I add or subtract? Remember that Kelvin's the bigger one. Of the two, Kelvin is always bigger. Okay? Fahrenheit's the one that could catch up weirdly under extremely high temperatures. But if you at least remember, at least for these two, Kelvin will always be the bigger one. If you want Kelvin, make it big. If you want Celsius, make it smaller. Does that make sense? So just remember that fact, and that'll help you remember which direction to go, because these are easy. Now, the not as easy one is the Celsius to Fahrenheit. And this is something, though, at least you learned in your younger years. If you happened to want Fahrenheit, just because you're looking at a temperature like, I wonder what that would be here. I wonder what I would call this temperature. Um, Fahrenheit is going to be nine-fifths the Celsius temperature plus the 32 degrees that equates zero Celsius to 32 Fahrenheit. Nine-fifths the Celsius, or nine-fifths T sub C is the formula that we'll use in our book, uh, plus the 32 degrees. If you want to go the other direction, well, you could use literal equations, subtract 32 from the Fahrenheit, and then multiply by the reciprocal, five-ninths. Five-ninths T sub F minus 32. Again, most of the time, we'll be using this second one because you may be given temperatures and problems in Fahrenheit because that's what we relate to. We'll have to take it out of Fahrenheit, make it Celsius. If you wanted to go from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, you have to go through the Celsius temperature to get there. So if you want to go Fahrenheit to Kelvin, convert to Celsius, Celsius to Kelvin, or vice versa to go the other direction. Again, Celsius is the main one we'll use in this class because it is used in science and it's used worldwide on a regular basis, more so than Kelvin. People don't use Kelvin on a regular basis. So even though it is a scientific scale, Celsius kind of strikes the perfect balance of practical and scientific at once. Let's take a look at the math then involved with these temperature conversions. Turn over to page 209. Turn over to page 209. And look, if you would, please, at, um, oops, that wasn't smart. Look at uh, example 140 or 14.3. It says, what's the value of 294.2 Kelvin expressed in degrees Celsius? Well, Celsius is the little guy, right? Celsius can go into the negatives. So we subtract 273.15. Notice they did that. And uh, now notice the way sig figs work. Celsius and Kelvin is strictly addition subtraction, right? Multiplication, you count the sig figs. Here we don't count it, remember? Addition, subtraction, sig figs are based on place value. So they took a tenths minus a hundredths. You round the answer to tenths, even though it's only three sig figs. So they give you four sig figs, 
but you only use three sig figs in the answer because you're basing sig figs on place value. Say to the 294.2 minus 273.15 at 21.05 or rounded 21.1 degrees. Make sense? Now, you come to letter B. Now, what is that in Fahrenheit? Well, now that you know Celsius, plug it in for the Fahrenheit equation, and uh, we're going to use the non-rounded value, the 21.05. One could argue the 32 is two sig figs. I believe that is exactly 32, so we won't base our sig figs on that. There was a subtraction used. I would differ with them on this one. Um, 21.05 times 9 fifths at the 32. In that I would not have rounded a three sig fix here because although you're using an addition, we're assuming infinite significance from the 32. Otherwise, we would have said hunt your nearest whole number. And uh, the subtraction, although used, we also used a multiplication. I would have gone with the four sig figs. They went with the three. Sig figs get a little dicey here. Um, just put your answer, either 69.89 or 69.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Questions on the conversion there, the two-step conversion to Fahrenheit. Uh, look at the next example. It says, when the cell, what is the Celsius temperature when a Fahrenheit thermometer reads 72 degrees? Well, if they want Celsius and we know Fahrenheit, there's the equation we're going to use more frequently. T sub C equals 5 ninths, the Fahrenheit minus 32. You take the 72 minus 32 is 40, multiply that by 5 ninths, we get 22.2 repeating. Round it off. Again, we multiply, so we use sig figs, 22.2 degrees Celsius. Questions on that? Pretty straightforward. All right, now there's, you're going to do a couple of these kind of problems for homework this evening, but I want to work problem five over on page 221 with you uh, right now. It's kind of an interesting problem. So page 221, problem number five. Go ahead and read that for us, if you would, Audrey. What, what temperature? Do the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales give the same number? At what temperature do the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales give the same reading? Now remember, we said for every 5 degrees Celsius, Fahrenheit changes class 9, nine degrees. Hence the 9 fifths or the 5 ninths, depending on your perspective. So obviously, if we're looking at... Um, you know, most of our numbers, right? For instance, right now in this room, it's about 70 degrees. Well, Celsius, that'd be like 20 something degrees, right? So Celsius is lower. But because Fahrenheit moves faster, at one point as the temperature drops, Fahrenheit drops faster than Celsius drops, at some point they're gonna be equal to each other. And the question is, what is that magic temperature? Well, since we don't know the temperature Celsius, we might call it X. But we also know it's going to be the same for the Fahrenheit. So what we can do is we can take the Fahrenheit conversion, 9 fifths T sub C, I'm so used to the old one from junior high, plus 32, and we can take the Celsius temperature, 5 ninths T sub F minus 32, and we can set the two formulas equal to each other. But since Celsius and Fahrenheit will be the same temperature, I could just call it X. That would give me what equation here, Michael? x plus 32 equals 5 ninths x minus 32. The quantity x minus 32. Uh, at this point, uh, we should uh, get rid of the fractions for sure, right? Multiply everything by the LCD, which is class 45. So multiply everything by 45. Here, 45 and 5 cancel to give us 9. So we get 81x. Somebody with a calculator, 45 times 32. 1440. Here 45 and 9 cancel to give us a 5. 5 times 5 is 25. And the 25 needs to be distributed. 25 times x? And 25 times a negative 32. Negative 800. All right, we can um, bring this over here, send that over there. What do we get for the x when we combine them? 56x is equal to, and on the other side, negative 2240. Divide both sides by 56. What do we get? Exactly negative 40 degrees. If you were to look at a Celsius temperature thermometer, Celsius Fahrenheit thermometer, you know, it kind of has the little markings on the side. If it goes down to negative 40, you'll notice it's the exact same. Now, you might remember, if you go way back in your mind, to your junior high days. You had these equations with C and F instead of T sub F and T sub C. 
I believe in seventh grade, they introduced you to another formula that was an alternate formula you could use. That one was based on negative 40. And it's just kind of an interesting other way to use it because negative 40 Celsius and negative 40 Fahrenheit are the exact same numbers. All right now, once you drop below that, Fahrenheit will continue to drop faster than Celsius will. As you rise above it, Fahrenheit rises faster than Celsius will, but they'll be the same at that point. All right, um, we're going to watch that video very quickly, and then we got to send you to Pete today. For now, though, write down your homework. Homework is to read pages 211 to 213. Read pages 211 to 213. On page 220, answer questions 11 to 16. Page 220, questions 11 through 16. And on page 221, page 221, um, do problems 3 and 4. I'm trying to multitask and not doing very well. Page 221, problems 3 and 4. So page 220, questions 11 to 16. Page 221, problems 3 and 4. Have a wonderful rest of your day.